Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is part two of our three-part series on how to start, grow, and ultimately maintain a dominating law firm website. Today we're going to talk about the growth phase for estate planning attorneys. Today's webinar is being recorded and it's going to be available to replay online next week. And we're also going to make the slides available so there's no need to take notes unless you want to. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover today. This webinar is scheduled to run for two hours. The other webinars that we've done for other practice areas have lasted between two hours and about two hours and 10 minutes, just depending on the pace and the questions. We're not going to be able to stop and answer questions during the presentation, but if you're having technical difficulties with the, uh, the GoToWebinar audio or video, let us know via the chat area of the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll have a questions and answers session at the end of the presentation, so if you do have questions along the way, please add them to the questions area or send us a chat message and we'll address it at the end of the webinar. My name is Victoria Blut, and I'm the community manager here at Lawlytics. My passion is for education. I love teaching attorneys attorneys about what works on the web and keeping them up to date on the latest in web technologies and trends. If you've joined us for other webinars in this series, then you know that our CEO, uh, attorney Dan Jaffe, normally introduces each of these webinars. However, he's away today, so I'm going to fill in for him. But if you're not familiar with him, let me briefly introduce him to you. Before Dan became the full-time CEO of Lawlytics, he built two successful law firms in both Washington State and Arizona. And he started a highly successful online legal directory that was later acquired by a large internet company. And during Dan's years of practice, he himself will tell you that he made a lot of marketing investments and he also got badly burned several times. And what this led him to realize was that nobody was going to care about his practice like he did. And that in order for him to succeed, he needed to understand how the internet works, how potential clients were using the internet, and he needed to be in control of his marketing. So he did the heavy lifting to figure this out early on. And that's why he co-founded Lawlytics, to make it easy for attorneys to be in control of their marketing without wasting their time or their money. And today he loves showing fellow attorneys how this stuff really works. If you attended the first webinar in this series, then you're already familiar with our presenters today. I'm going to introduce, or as the case may be, reintroduce each of them to you now so, um, so that we can jump from one presenter to the next without any sort of delay once we get started. Our first speaker today is Rachel Shalott. Rachel holds a JD and a master's and practiced law before joining Lawlytics. She is the vice president of content operations here at Lawlytics, which means that she's in charge of all of our content operations, which produce millions of written words for our members' websites and blogs each year. In last month's webinar, Rachel demonstrated the basic building blocks of content to get law firms started in the right direction. And today, Rachel is going to build on that information and take you deeper into the strategy and the execution of growing an estate planning web presence. Next up, we have Sophia Oliboni, who holds a master's degree in web design and is a design specialist here at Lawlytics. When we have new members sign up for our service, she and her team help them choose their design preferences based on their goals. And in last month's webinar, Sophia presented the basic considerations for starting a web presence. Today, Sophia's segment is going to take you deeper into design considerations that can influence the growth and effectiveness of your website. And then lastly, there is me. Um, I come from a journalism background, and as I said, I'm the community manager here at Lawlytics. If you are a frequent reader of our blog, you might be familiar with me. Um, in the last webinar, I went into great detail about how search engines work, about various types of content that lawyers should include when they're starting their website. And today, I'm going to explore how social media can work with your law firm's website to amplify your firm's signal, to extend your reach, 
and to reinforce your reputation. Today, I'm also going to present growth strategies that consistently work for our members when done over time. So before we get to the presentation, I want to spend a bit of time on a couple foundational items. Um, before I turn the mic over to Rachel to talk about content, I want to briefly review who we are, what we do, and why it matters. So you have many choices of companies and technologies to design, build, host, and help you market your law firm's website. And at Lawlytics, we do all of that, and we have a lot of competition. So what is Lawlytics, and how are we different? Our company is obsessed with the pursuit of the most efficient method of marketing for each law firm. And as we see it, there are two major variables of efficiency, time and money. Lawlytics was created to empower law firms to have unlimited marketing success without wasting either their time or their money. And we have two different types of competitors. On the one side, we have full service marketing companies like uh, Fine Law and Martindale Nolo. And Lawlytics is built to give attorneys all of the upsides of using a full service company without exposing you to the potential risks and downsides. On the other side, we have do-it-yourself website software programs like WordPress and Wix that are cheap or free to use. And these programs come with steep opportunity costs and attorneys often struggle to make them work, which unfortunately has them wasting their time and missing opportunities along the way. So while both full service companies and do-it-yourself platforms are viable options, Lawlytics offers a more practical solution for lawyers. Our company works exclusively with lawyers and our services are adaptable to every stage of a law firm's growth. Our members can start as small as they choose and grow as big as they decide without taking dangerous risks or committing to things that might not work. And our software was built exclusively for lawyers, so the learning curve is easy. It enables our members to add and edit their websites and turn their efforts into new business without struggling. So here at Lawlytics, we talk differently than most legal marketing companies. And the reason for that is between our investors and our CEO, Dan Jaffe, there's more than 40 years of experience in terms of lawyers who have been in private practice owning and managing their own law firms. After um, our speakers, I'm going to start my presentation with this slide here. Um, at that time, I'll show you why the above measurements that you see are the only ones that really matter when it comes to building your estate planning website. There are a lot of law firm marketing vendors who trade in secret formulas and incantations and magic tricks and assorted forms of snake oil. And my presentation is going to focus on the things that you see listed in this slide. Our thesis here at Lawlytics is that all successful law firm marketing begins and ends with these key performance indicators that you see here. It's about making your marketing work without wasting your time and without wasting your money. We want to encourage you to be a student of your own business and to be brutally honest with yourself and your staff about your marketing and to insist that any marketing vendors that you do engage with are brutally honest as well. These metrics that you see here provide a true north. They speak clearly, they cut through the noise and the distraction, and the signal that they provide can light the way for any law firm to grow and to meet even their, their biggest and most audacious goals. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Rachel, who is going to talk to you a little bit about content and growing your estate planning website. Rachel? Thank you, Victoria. Um, as you heard earlier, I practiced criminal defense in Pennsylvania before joining Lawlytics. Now I oversee our content department. We work with attorney clients to plan, create, and refine their web content. If you were with us in our start series, one of the last things we spoke about was collecting data. I discussed tracking the types of clients your firm seems to naturally attract and the types of legal services that major the majority of your clients are requesting, along with examining some larger trends in your geographic area, or trends in policy or legislation, which will affect your practice area. Now it becomes time to act on that data that you've collected. 
And what I mean by this is you're going to allow it to influence your marketing strategy when you sit down to plan what areas you want to hit the most heavily as far as content goes on your website. And when you're in this situation, we really alert, we really urge you to allow the data to help guide your strategy, but not to be trigger happy. And what I mean is we've seen firms who focus extensively in one area to the exclusion of all others. And this will lead visitors to their sites be a little bit confused as far as what types of cases the firm handles. They seem to really focus in this area. Maybe they don't do this so often. So, you know, maybe find someone else that does. Again, just having a strategic approach. We will talk about creating multiple websites when you have something in particular you'd like to highlight in a few minutes. But right now, I'm going to focus on taking what you've learned and starting to grow your online presence. So when you set out to grow your site, we advise that the mass, vast majority of firms allocate their efforts in the following ways. And the first one is always creating a critical mass of substantive content for your site. And to do this, you're going to be continuously adding practice area pages to your site. You want to achieve a desired site size. Now, the desired size is going to depend on your practice area, your geographic location, and what your competitors are doing. To illustrate this, a dominating criminal defense firm in the Los Angeles area, we see site sizes around 900 to 1100 pages. But if we're looking at a dominating divorce attorney in Des Moines, Iowa, we see site sizes that are closer to around 100 pages. And we've been conducting market research where we examine different geographic areas, different practice areas, kind of see what sites are doing the best. And the, the main thing we've seen over the past few years, consistent element, is that sites that are very, very high ranking, high performing, very competitive, they have a high volume of pages for the area. And next is blogging. Blogging consistently will definitely benefit your site. And we recommend that you do try to blog regularly, but that you don't make blogging the primary focus of your content efforts until you've grown your site to a substantial size. So, for example, say you have a, you know, a total goal at the outset of, of writing 100 pages, 100 evergreen pages for your site. We, we recommend that you wait until you hit a benchmark of maybe 20%, maybe 30% of this goal until you really focus, shift more of your focus over to blogging. And that's when you can start doing things such as blogging more frequently, engaging in more sophisticated blogging techniques and that's also something I'm going to be talking about in a little bit um, but I do want to I do want to take a minute here and just give a caution that there really isn't a one-size-fits-all strategy for growth so for example if we were working with an immigration firm who was sort of in this growth phase we would really advise a shift to pressing down a little bit harder on blogging because there have just been incredibly rapid developments in immigration policies. We're seeing things change day to day, week to week. Um, and so that information, the way that information is easily shared and digested, is going to be better served for blogging. So when something like this does happen, there's an activity around a certain area that's relevant to your practice area, then we do say, you know, be a little bit flexible you can shift over to blogging more about it because when it's something that a mass audience is very interested in, they want to read about it, they want to consume it, and they want to hear what an expert has to say about it. They want your opinion on it. So when something like that happens, we definitely advise that you do capitalize upon it, especially if you have a pretty developed network to which you're sharing your content. And that brings me to the third area here, which is sharing your content. Your primary focus, of course, is going to be on creating the content. But you also want to get your content out to the public. Victoria will be speaking about implementing a common sense social media strategy later on in the webinar. So I'm going to leave those details up to her. 
And then finally, and generally in most cases, it's not going to be the primary focus of, of what you're doing when you're growing your online presence, but it is something to keep on your radar, and that is online reputation management. In the growth phase, you'll be reaching out to satisfied clients, you're going to be seeking reviews for your site, you're going to be getting reviews from other, that will be posted to other third-party sites. So it's a really good idea to perform an audit of your firm occasionally. You're just trying to see what comes up when a potential client might be using a search engine and looking for information about your firm name, looking for information about attorneys who work in your firm, just getting an idea of what your online presence seems to look like. And again, later in the webinar, Victoria is going to go into much greater detail about specific tools that attorneys can use to manage their online reputation. So right now, I just want to take some time and dive a little bit more deeply into these first two areas of content creation. And I want to start with writing your practice area pages. Like I mentioned before, reaching a critical mass as far as size goes is really key. And the fastest and best way you're going to get there is by creating substantive pages that deal with topics related to your practice area. When we discuss substantive pages in our start series of webinars, our main focus was really on creating a few broad overview pages. And what our goal was at that point was to adequately describe the legal services the firm provides. And so we're sort of giving the reader a general overview of what legal principles will be involved. If they're in a particular situation, why might they need legal counsel? What they might face if they need to pursue this particular legal service? However, now that we're in the grow phase, we're really focusing heavily on fleshing these pages out. So we're going to get more and more detailed. And our approach is going to be somewhat akin to the structure of a tree, where we're adding branches that are getting smaller and more numerous as we go. We first make sure we have those broad categories covered. So we make sure we have a page written for each of these. And more sophisticated topics, more detailed topics, might be mentioned briefly or might be subheadings. But then what we're going to do as we're building is we're going to write individual pages for each one of these. We're going to be getting more and more detailed, more and more specific as we go. So if we launch on a page that has some information about, let's say, um, writing a will, when we launch, we're going to have just, the pa just a page that kind of details what a will is, why you need a will, what happens when you don't have a will, and it's going to, like I said, we want someone who's not familiar with that concept to walk away and have a general idea of what they'll be facing and why they need legal assistance. However, as we grow, we're going to be getting much more detailed. We can write individual pages about the requirements for a will. Who is a testator? Who is a beneficiary? What happens with real property, what happens with things such as retirement accounts. And then again, we're going to take each one of those topics and we're going to break it down even more. So if we have a page on requirements for a will, we're going to break that down into individual pages. And some of the things that we might be writing about might have been, like I said, they might be topic headings in that initial page. So if we have a page about the requirements for a will and we mention witnesses. We might do a paragraph, a couple of paragraphs, but then again, as we grow, we want to get more detailed. So we're going to write a whole page on witnesses. And we're not getting rid of anything that we wrote originally. We're going to keep those pages. But what we're doing is we're adding children and the pages we wrote before become parent pages. So we're adding to the volume, we're adding to the authority of the site. We're going to get much more detail into each element that's related to the initial pages that we wrote. So we're keeping everything and we're just building on it. Because what we're doing is we're adding volume to the site and we're adding credibility to the site. The site is becoming more and more of an authority. And another thing we're doing is we get more and more detailed with our FAQ pages. FAQ pages are something that we really, really encourage 
firms to have when they launch because we can we can cover so much ground in an FAQ page. We can write about things related to our firm, such as you know if a potential client contacts the firm, how long might they wait for a response. But we can also cover general questions related to different legal services. So it, it becomes a catch-all kind of at that beginning phase. But as we grow, we add more FAQ pages, and those FAQ pages are going to get, they're going to get more detailed. So we might have a general FAQ page uh, when we launch, but then as we're growing, we're going to have an FAQ page that relates specifically to wills. We're going to have an FAQ page that relates specifically to trusts, and so on and so forth. And so what we're doing is we're just enhancing our ability to give readers information that they're searching for in the manner in which they tend to search the most. And a lot of times, as Victoria talks about in a lot of our webinars, users are transitioning more and more to semantic queries. So they're typing in, they're seeking information the same way that they speak. So it's that question format. So again, we're making those FAQ pages just more detailed. Always, as we grow, more and more detailed, more and more specific. So another important aspect that we're focusing on when we're growing are local pages and resource pages. So Victoria covered local pages in depth at the start, in the start series of our webinar. We have a great blog article out on that right now. But just to recap, a local page is one that gives their potential clients relevant information that they might require. Um, such as where probate court is located, where you might go to pay particular fees. And the information you want to include on this doesn't need to be legal in nature or related to particular legal services. In fact, we found some of the most really popular and um, the best written local pages have information that's ju it's just difficult for people to find anywhere else. So if there's a trick about, you know, if you do need to go to probate court where you might park, or if uh, finding a particular office in the courthouse is very confusing, and having detailed information, things like this. Again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture your local audience. So users who are searching for information related to legal services in your area. Resource pages. These typically provide information for local, usually non-legal organizations that provide services your potential clients might be interested in. Um, so this can include things such as counseling services, um, grief counseling groups, things of this nature. And having these types of pages serves a number of purposes. Um, it's giving, like I said, it's giving relevant information to potential clients. It's also adding to the credibility of your site as an authority. And it can be a jumping off point for forming or showcasing connections that you have with local organizations. Um, and this can help, of course, you know, boost your client base. And by showing that you, you're really invested in your, in your community and you're invested in the services that your clients might need. They know that you understand where they are in their lives right now and that you care and that you're taking your time. You know, so, so let's say that, you know, you have a link to a group that, that provides grief counseling services for local kids, but you also volunteer there. You know, you might have a couple staff members who volunteer periodically with the group. This is something that's really great to include in a local page or resource page. Sometimes firms write, you know, a particular page that focuses specifically on their connection to the community. Um, and it's really good to highlight these types of things. And we've seen that, you know, sometimes these become very symbiotic. So attorneys or staff members from the firm form a relationship with a local organization, and then this becomes a referral source. So as you're growing your site and adding practice area pages, don't forget to provide this type of local information as well as showcasing relationships you have with community organizations. And next I wanted to discuss blogging. When you're just starting out, it is important to blog. But like I said, it doesn't need to be the main focus of your content creation when you're just starting to grow your site. At the beginning, 
you want to periodically write blog art articles that highlight important developments in your practice area or developments in current events that might be of interest to your potential audience. You want to come up with a frequency you can maintain at this point, be it once a week or 10 times a month. And once you've reached a certain point in the build of your evergreen pages, you can shift more time and resources on blogging, kind of getting more sophisticated with it. What I mean by this is taking some time to predict or analyze what topics you should be writing about and when. Um, one thing we found that can be very, very effective is writing a blog series. So that's when you're covering related information over a number of posts, and this might span a few weeks or a few months. And this is best done at a strategic time, so a time when the information has the best chance to reach the intended audience. There are some tools that can be really helpful that um, can kind of to help you predict this. And one of these is Google Trends. It's just a free, it's a free service that Google offers. And what you can do with this is you can view how users seek information over time in a particular region. So in the graph I have on this slide here, I pulled data on the search term power of attorney, specifically in Chicago, Illinois. So if we examine the five-year search history of this word, you'll see that I've circled in red five different peaks. Now, this is each one of these spikes occurs in January. In January of each year, um, you know, for whatever reason, if it if it corresponds with the new year, people are looking at changes. People are interested in this in particular. We see uh, we see a high concentration of activity. We people are are out there. They're looking for this term, and that happens to be pretty frequently. And again, it's five years, so this is a pattern that seems to be you know it seems to be pretty strong. So if we are going to do a series on, you know, what is a power of attorney, how can I create a power of attorney, what are the situations in which a power of attorney might be necessary, it might be a really good idea to do this every year, you know, starting in December and going into the new year. So you can capitalize upon the high volume of search activity, which is going to occur during this time. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. And talk about some mistakes we've seen. We've seen so many firms really take off and be very successful with their practices in the grow phase, but we've also had some hit some stumbling blocks. So I just wanted to just discuss what we see the most common that's just sort of tripping people up when they're trying to grow. And the first is a disorganized approach. And this is something we commonly encounter with firms where there, there's more than one person writing for the site. But it can also happen when we have just one author. Something I really emphasized in the start portion of our webinars is that when you ever anticipate having multiple authors, and I don't mean that when you're starting out you have multiple authors, it might be that as you grow and you take on associates, or you might have some summer law externs come on in the future and you're having people who aren't you write for your site. It's really, really important that you establish guidelines for tone, voice, and the structure of pages on your site. So when this is skipped, sometimes we see things that can be really confusing to a user coming to the site. Um, for example, we might have a call to action that is worded differently on different pages. So we might see something that says, we are your Western Pennsylvania estate planning attorneys, covering Erie, Pittsburgh, and Butler. Now we might see on a different page, we are your Pittsburgh estate planning attorneys. Again, what this does is this can create confusion on the part of the user. The user might think, okay, well, I was on this page about wills, and it said that they do their Pittsburgh, um, you know, I'm in Butler, and on the other page, the power of attorney page said they, they covered Butler. Maybe they just do power of attorneys in Butler, and, and, and they just have people who do wills in Pennsylvania. Again, it's just, it's a confusing experience. In a little bit, Sophia is going to talk to you about how it's really important to keep your branding and design consistent. So you want your logo to look the same, whether it's on your website, 
on a billboard or on a pen because you want people to remember you. And so it's also very important that your voice remains co consistent and your writing remains consistent throughout your site. And also under this um, related is a lack of strategy. And that can happen with just even one author. So say you're not sure when you're going to have time to write for your site. And when that free hour crops up here and there, you sit down and you sort of just pick a topic at random and, and you bang on a page. You will be adding to the overall volume and authority of your site, but you're really missing out on an opportunity to concentrate your efforts in an area where you think you can get the most business and where you can give your website a concentrated boost. Like I mentioned, collecting and examining that data, you know, what kind of cases are we attracting? What type of clients are we getting? How can we capitalize upon that strategically when we're adding content to our site? That's how you're going to get the best ROI and you're going to get the most strategic concentrated boosts. And next, um, we've seen a lot of issues come up when firms work with SEO companies. And this really runs the gamut from, from kind of minimal things to, to pretty severe issues. Um, I'm sure you're, you're well aware that there are many, many SEO companies operating today. They kind of seem to love nothing more than inundating attorneys with terrifying reports about website performance. Um, however, I, I think it's really, really important to be aware of the fact that there is no regulatory body that governs SEO companies. So we all had to have our character and fitness examined. We had to sit for the MPRE before we could be admitted to practicing law. And the reason why is because there's a governing body in every state that sort of is the watchdog for behaviors that attorneys take. And the reason why they exist is because they want to make sure that attorneys are always acting in the best interest of their clients. However, there's no a regulatory body that makes sure that SEO companies are acting in the best interest of their clients. And so what we've seen is attorneys can be hurt pretty badly by SEO companies. Um, like I said, this can be a range of things, a range of harms. Sometimes it's relatively minor. Um, SEO company fills the site with, with keyword stuffed content. What happens is that URL is going to take a hit with Google, and it might take months of adding good organic content for the URL to be able to recover. However, we've seen some, some much more serious consequences come from working with SEO companies. Um, and I think a lot of that is because SEO companies don't understand the ethical rules that we operate under, the professional obligations that attorneys must adhere to when engaging in advertising practices. Everything you're doing online, when you're promoting your firm, when you have calls to action, these are advertising practices and they're regulated by our states. Some states are much more strict than others, but that's something that uh, by and large we just don't see. As SEO companies aren't aware of it and a lot of times they act in flagrant violation of it. Um, on this slide here, this is actually a modified screenshot of something that we discovered. An SEO company was taking just Shutterstock images and they were creating fake lawyers, they were giving these lawyers fake names, fake backgrounds, and then they were operating blogs under these fake attorneys' names. And the blogs were solely for the purpose of promoting the content um, of the firm that they were working for. However, when we look at the professional rules in place where this firm was located, it specifically prohibits any advertising activities that include individuals who are purporting to be attorneys who haven't actually been admitted to practice law. So again, if you're not in control or you're not aware of what these companies might be out there on the internet doing in the name of your firm on your behalf, you could really be putting yourself, you could be putting your firm, you know, it's a, it's a very substantial risk and it's a risk you just shouldn't take. So it's something you always need to be very, very wary of and make sure that you're in control and you know what's going on. And next, um, we've seen multiple websites when it's not, it's not really warranted. 
there might be a time when, when having multiple websites is actually a good idea. In fact, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Um, but we've seen several firms think, kind of take the idea that they're going to saturate the market with sites for their firm. And by doing so, they can gain an advantage. But oftentimes, this isn't what happens. Um, if we have multiple sites out there focusing on the same geographic area and they're promoting the same service by the same firm, what they're going to do is they're just going to compete against each other. And the end result is they're going to be pushing each other down. So both sites become less competitive. So it's definitely something you want to avoid. And then finally, unrealistic expectations. So as I mentioned earlier, top criminal defense firm, Los Angeles, 1,000-page site. Divorce firm in Des Moines, 100 page late. However, if someone thinks they can walk into LA and put up 50 pages and, and really dominate that market area, they might be in for a rude awakening. But what we see all too often is attorneys have unrealistic expectations, you know, related to site volume or a lot of times related to time. And then what happens is they become prime prey for the trap of of kind of changing marketing strategies just all too often without really committing to a content strategy long enough to let it work. And Victoria's going to talk in greater detail about why consistency in your marketing strategy is key. So next I want to transition into some lessons we've learned from firms who've been very successful and have really grown their site really well. Um, so first off, they have a really organized, strategic approach to adding content to their site. So when we work with firms and we're going to do, you know, a longer term content build, we come up with, generally we don't like doing plans shorter than six months because what we want to do is we want to really plan out exactly what's going to happen. We want to plan, a, you know, have a long term approach, know what we're going to do when. And whether attorneys are working with us or whether they're doing it on their own, when it, it's organized and strategic, it, it's going to be the most effective. So these attorneys know what they want to target first. They know who will write what. They know when things are going to be written and published. So they're spreading that content out, and the site is getting a consistent boost of new content. And they're planning for any eventualities, um, such as they know maybe at a particular time of the year when they'll be most busy and they're not going to have time to write for their site. They're not going to have time to blog. And they have a plan in advance of who will step in and take their place. And then secondly, they employ the strategy of having multiple websites when it is warranted. Again, we don't want these sites competing against each other. But sometimes firms might have a particular element or a particular service area that it's really effective to highlight and creating a multiple site can be an effective way to, to really achieve this. So for example, let's say your firm is located near a large military base and you have an associate who is a veteran and you really want to focus on helping veterans, helping those who are still in the services and their families. And you really want to highlight the fact that you you know you have an attorney who who knows what you're up against, who knows what you you know, who knows about deployment, who knows about all of the paperwork that need to be done pre-deployment, who knows what it's like to come back, um, who knows what it's like to face that transition from military life to civilian life. So here what we're we'd be doing is we're highlighting a connection. You know, we're highlighting the experience and the background of one particular attorney because we have a particular target audience and we think that we have something that's really unique. And what we want to do is we want to give it the best chance at reaching that particular target audience. So again, we're not creating two sites for the same firm, the same area. What we're doing is we're creating an ancillary site, but that ancillary site has a very particular and strategic goal. We know what we're trying to achieve. And we've really seen this be very, very effective. And then next is having realistic expectations. So obviously here, inverse of what I just spoke about with unrealistic expectations, firms who really know that organic content marketing, it's going to require a particular amount of time and a particular amount of effort 
and they really do stick with their strategy over the long term. They are so much more likely to see it come to fruition than those who are changing marketing tactics every six months. Again, it's a difficult position to be in because you want to start seeing traction. You want to see that reward for your efforts. Um, but becoming frustrated and deciding to change gears too quickly is just, we can't caution against doing that enough because, again, it's a long-term thing. Sticking with your strategy, giving it time, is the key to seeing it really become successful and really thrive. Um, and then finally, Firms who, who really do well identify and capitalize upon their unique selling proposition. And this might be something that you know from the start. Or it might be something that evolves over time. And you never know what might strike a chord with your local audience. It might be the logo you chose. It might be your tagline. It might be a page you have that gives really detailed information about where to park if you need to go to the probate court. It might be a promotional online video that a summer logs during creative that really gains traction. So you should always have your finger on the pulse of what is resonating and be able to really capitalize upon that. So to wrap up, if you have any more specific questions regarding content for your site, I really encourage you to reach out to us. You can shoot us an email at writing at lawlytics.com or you can give us a call. Some of you might already be familiar with her, but Alyssa Rose is the director of our content services. And over the past couple of years, she's helped many, many attorneys plan and create their content. So if you have just a brief question, you want some additional resources or assistance planning for the long term, we are more than happy to help. And then last, I just want to mention the next webinar in our practice area series. And the next one is going to be Dominate. Our estate planning session is going to air on March 23rd, and it will be available on demand after the original air date. In this webinar, I'm going to be discussing adding various types of downloadable collateral to your site, expanding the scope of your practice, and we're going to look at some lessons we've learned from really dominating firms. So if you're interested in taking that next step, I really encourage you to join us on the 23rd or check that out on demand. And I'm now going to turn the mic over to Sophia, who will talk you through some design as you're growing your site. Thank you, Rachel. In the past part of this series, I discussed the various basic elements that make for a strong law firm website and what can take away from user experience and keep potential clients from contacting your firm. In the second part of this series, I'm going to dig deeper into the elements of design that can have a psychological effect on your potential clients and encourage them to engage with you. We'll discuss topics like choosing colors, what they mean and what they can say about your firm, the various shape of logos and how that can affect a potential client's perception of your firm. I'll make the case for the importance of a responsive website and I'll also discuss examples of how to make the content on your site more readable, which can increase client engagement. If you missed the first part in our Start, Grow, Dominate series, please feel free to visit the Lawlytics website and check out our webinars page to see my design tips from part one. So now we'll just dive right in into the shape of logos. In the first part of this series, we discuss what makes a good logo. Now we're going to dig a little bit deeper to discuss the psychology of shapes. So we're going to start first by talking about circles, ovals, and ellipse. These shapes tend to promote, to project um, a positive emotional message. And as a result, they're one of the most commonly used graphical shapes. Nature holds some of the first set of circles that a person sees, like the sun, the moon, stars, the earth, and some fruits and the iris of a human's eye. Circular logos can suggest defense, endurance, community, friendship, safety, love, and relationships. Circles have no beginning or end, which suggests things like energy and power. Rings have the implication of marriage or the partnership, suggesting stability and endurance. Many companies that have a global presence 
um, parallel products or services that value community and contributions or have been around to stand the test of time use circular logos. So some examples of circular logos would include ABC, Target, Starbucks, and NASA. So now let's talk about squares. Squares and rectangles suggest stability, but can also be used to show balance. The straight lines of a square suggest organization, strength, and intellect, structure, and efficiency. Squares are mostly found in man-made structures, and as a result, they've become a familiar shape that we trust. For example, items of furniture like chairs or, or tables are often square or rectangular. It should be noted that when combined with colors like blue or gray, squares and rectangles can appear cold and uninviting. And we'll talk a little bit more about colors later, but a good way to counteract that is to position a square in an unconventional way or to add more dynamic colors to it. When you do this, you can create something more interesting than just a basic square. Companies that want to inspire trust, stability, and strength often have square-shaped logos. And examples of those would be H&R Block, Home Depot, Microsoft, Goodwill, GM, Gap, Lego, and L. Now we're going to discuss triangles. Triangles are sometimes associated with power, science, religion, and law. Triangles can be positioned upright on their sides, and that position can create different meanings. When sitting on the base, triangles can be perceived to promote stability. On their side, triangles can suggest energy, purpose, and progression. A triangle on its side can also represent direction, movement, or speed because it resembles an arrow. Some examples of logos that feature triangles would include Delta, Mitsubishi, and Google Play. So we've talked about some basic shapes, but what about lines? So our minds may associate vertical lines and shapes with strength and aggression, courage and boldness. The precision of vertical lines can also suggest professionalism. Horizontal lines and shapes, on the other hand, can suggest community, tranquility, calm and peace. Jagged, sharp angles may appear as uh, aggressive or dynamic. They are associated with violence, action, and speed. On the other hand, soft, rounded letters give a youthful appeal. Curved shapes can suggest motion, happiness, rhythm, pleasure, and generosity. So now we're going to dive into the psychology of colors and the different meanings behind them. Color is extremely important in branding. When someone looks at a logo, the color is a firm, is a foremost thing that they will remember. In fact, according to Color Matters, 80% of visual information that we take in is related to color. So it's important to think about colors that are used in your logo and elsewhere on your website. And many brands have sets of colors trademarked for protection against other brands in the same market. For instance, Coca-Cola has its iconic red and white color scheme protected. These brands try to associate themselves with their color at a fundamental level. So when you hear one of these brands' names, it should be easy to think of its color. For example, look at McDonald's. When you hear McDonald's, you might think of the colors red and yellow together, or maybe even see the golden arch. Or UPS, how they associated the words dependable to their brand from the meaning of the main color that they use, which is brown. So let's talk about individual colors and the effect that they could have on potential clients. And we're going to start out with the color red. Red quickly catches people's attention. And one likely reason um, that they use it for things like stop signs. The most popular sentiment linked to red is love, but it also signifies passion and energy. The sight of this color and its alternative shades make people feel alive. Red can heighten hunger and be inviting at the same time. Therefore, it's often used at food establishments such as restaurants and diners. Red can also symbolize power, which is why it's a common color for both fictitious heroes and villains, like Superman or The Flash. 
Other meanings for red include ambition, power, and success, as well as strength, victory, and warmth. If you're thinking about alternatives to true red, you might try crimson, ruby, or scarlet. There are, of course, brands that you could think of when you think of the color red, and those brands might be, again, Coca-Cola, Virgin, and Target. Now we'll talk about orange. Orange is a color that's easily liked by children because of its warmth. Since it shares the name with a fruit, it's often associated with food or a beverage. Orange also symbolizes luxury and playfulness. Orange isn't as aggressive as red, but it can have the same stimulating effect to the human brain. Orange can uh, symbolize endurance, action, assurance, change, communication, creativity, enthusiasm, health, security, and wisdom, among a lot of other meanings. Alternatives to true orange would be apricot, carrot, peach, or tangerine. Brands popularized by this color would be Nickelodeon, Fanta, Blogger, and Golf. Now we'll dive into yellow. Yellow is believed to be the color of hope, and it's also associated with optimism and youthfulness. Since many of us were taught that it's the color of the sun, we associate it with bright days, which make people feel really happy. It may not be a coincidence that highlighters, pens, pencils, and legal pads are yellow, because yellow is considered to improve memory and focus. Yellow can also represent forgiveness, joy, intelligence, youth, and knowledge. If you're thinking about using yellow in a color, um, I'm sorry, in a logo, you can also consider some alternatives to true yellow like canary, goldenrod, lemon, or mustard. Brands popularized by this color would be Crayola, McDonald's, National Geographic, Post-it, and Subway. Now we'll, we'll dive into green. Widely identified as the color of life by many people, green is sometimes favored by those who want to inspire health and growth in the environment. Green, of course, is also the color of American money, and therefore it may be associated with wealth, especially if it's partnered with a color like gold. Green is also associated with concepts like adventure, calmness, cleanliness, efficiency, freedom, generosity, growth, health, hope, progress, safety, and sympathy. Alternatives to green would include asparagus, forest green, lime green, sea green, and olive green. Brands popularized by this color would be Animal Planet, Android, Heineken, Land Rover, and Starbucks. So now we'll dive into blue. Blue is a very popular color in general, but blue is also sometimes seen as a popular choice for social networking sites like Facebook. And this is because blue can signify relaxation and communication, effects that are sometimes achieved when socializing online. It is also a color associated with trust, and this encourages people to share almost anything in their lives. Since seas and clear skies are often blue, the color is easily related to rest, which makes it an easy choice for those who wish to invoke loosening up. Blue can represent acceptance, loyalty, honesty, dignity, and reliability, among other things. Alternatives to blue would be cerulean or turquoise or teal. Brands popularized by this color would be Dell, Facebook, Intel, Tumblr, and Twitter. Next, we'll discuss purple. Purple often reflects luxury. Many products choose purple to indicate lavishness. However, too much can come off as tacky, so exercise some restraint when you use this color. Purple can also be associated with intelligence, independence, and mystery. Since not too many natural things are this color, it can communicate excitement. Purple can represent things like intelligence and independence as well as val um, as well as values like wisdom and justice alternatives to purple would be violet amethyst lavender lilac and plum and brands popularized by this color would be cadbury hallmark crown royal welch's and yahoo 
Lastly, we'll discuss brown. This color of the earth signifies reliability, stability, and humility. Brown is considered as natural as green, which makes a lot of sense since they're often seen together in many living things like plants and trees. Brown signifies prudence. Brown isn't flashy or attention grabbing, but it doesn't need to be. It's a color that feels grounded. It can represent things like steadfastness, simplicity, friendliness, dependability, and health. Alternatives to brown would be bronze, chestnut, mahogany, and taupe. Brands popularized by this color would be M&M, Louis Vuitton, and of course, UPS. So now that we've discussed the different meaning behind shapes and colors, now would be a good time to take a look at your branding and to see if it represents your company in the best way possible. If not, maybe consider pairing a new shape with the best color to give off the meaning that you want to give off about your firm. Next, we'll discuss a responsive website and why it is crucial to have one. Now, if you spend some time thinking about your online legal marketing, you may have heard the term responsive design come up. So what exactly is a responsive website? A responsive website is a site that responds or changes based on the device that it's being viewed on. For example, if your law firm's website has a three column layout on a desktop or a laptop, then on a tablet or a mobile device, it might change to a single column display. Responsive design may also hide things like unnecessary images so that they don't interfere or compete with more important information when the site is being viewed from a mobile device. Responsive sites not only have dynamic content that changes based on screen size and condensed navigation, it also features optimized images and correct padding and spacing. Now, if you're wondering whether or not your current website is responsive, and yes, if you're a Lawlytics member, your site is 100% responsive. But here's a good way that you can check if you're unsure. If you're on your computer, you can tell if your site is responsive by reducing your browser's window size from full screen down to the smallest size. If the text and the images in the navigation change to accommodate the smaller window, then your site is most likely responsive. So now, what's the difference between a responsive website and a mobile-friendly website? One way to think about this is to remember that a responsive website is mobile-friendly, but not all mobile-friendly sites are responsive, and here's why. While a responsive site is one that was originally designed to accommodate a variety of screen sizes and devices, a mobile-friendly website is one that is designed to work exactly the same across all devices. This means that nothing about the site changes whether you're on a desktop, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. The website is simply made a little smaller so that you can see it on the device but the features are still scaled for desktop, which makes it too heavy for mobile, and it might make the features hard to use. Users may have to enlarge your text to be able to read it. They might have to struggle to be able to click on your navigation and become frustrated and leave your site. So it's a very important thing to distinguish between. If your site is mobile friendly but not responsive, you may have already frustrated potential clients. And stats tell us that it's likely that your next client will visit your website from a mobile device. And as I explained in the first part of this series, a user's first line of defense when encountering a site that's hard to use is to leave. So this is something that's very important for attorneys to think about. This day and age, a 100% responsive website is crucial. Next, we'll talk about slimming down your website. As I mentioned in the first part of this series, there are some attorneys who really want to add every single bell and whistle to their website. And I can understand why that's appealing. There are some features that just look really cool and interesting, or maybe you've seen it on a, on a competitor's, competitor's website and you want something similar. But bells and whistles create something, they create some really, some real problems, not only from a design perspective, but also from a potential client's. 
in this next section, we're going to talk about slimming down and refining what's on your website to give your users an optimal experience that encourages them to engage with you. So now we're going to talk about removing heavy elements. So a lot of the bells and whistles that attorneys want to put on their, on their law firm's websites have a couple of problems. They don't serve any real purpose for their potential client. They may confuse the client by creating a lack of direction, and they weigh down a site because they tend to be rather heavy elements. When you're thinking about your web design, keep this in mind. Everything you put on your website has to have a function and a purpose. Be selective about the things that you put on your website. You may want to do an audit of your current website and ask yourself, what value does this element add to my visitor's experience? What benefit does it offer them? If the answer is nothing, then don't use that item. There's a lot of debate among web developers about the use of sliders. Sliding images on your homepage can help to communicate several important messages in the same space. The problem is that most visitors don't wait around for the third or fourth slide. They start scrolling down and then the sliding images just become a distraction at that point. So one thing we sometimes notice is that attorneys often ask if they should have a slider on the website. They may have seen it on another competitor's site and they want one too, but the answer to whether or not you should have a slider on your website is it depends. And here is what it depends on. If you don't have a lot of content on your website, a slider can act like an unnecessary element. It can distract your potential clients from what you want them to read or where you want them to go. If there's not enough content there, sliders can even bore your potential clients. However, if you have a lot of strong content that you want to drive traffic to, a slider may be a really good choice for that. A combination of a good image that supports and strengthens your message alongside some high quality content can keep your potential clients engaged. And if the content is strong and interesting, that can be enough to keep them focused on the slider. But the bottom line is that you shouldn't have a slider for the sake of having one, and you shouldn't use images for the sake of having them either. Be strategic about what you do and what you choose to put on your website. Now we'll discuss different ways that you can increase readability upon your site. Readability is, is an important part of your site's refinement. It's something that I discussed a little bit during the first part of this series, but I bring it up again because it's a valuable thing for attorneys to understand. And here are some elements that can increase readability for your website's content. And the first thing would be choosing your fonts wisely. So on this slide, I have the four most common font types. And that would be serif, sans serif, script, and display. Serif fonts would be fonts like Times New Roman, Rockwell and Baskerville. They're the fonts that have the little feet at the top and the bottom of the font. These fonts are considered to be uh, more traditional and serious, but I find that they are a little harder to read on websites, so they are best used for headlines only. Next, you have the sans serif fonts, which are similar to the serif fonts but without the little feet, and they are viewed to be more modern. These fonts would include options like Helvetica or Century Gothic. And, and as I said a little earlier, they are easier to read on a website. So these are the types of fonts that you would want to use for the body of your site. Then you have the other two font categories, which would be scripts and display fonts. Now these fonts often look really interesting. But they can be challenging to read and might give up, might give off the wrong impression about your law firm because they often come off as cartoonish or kiddish. So for that reason, I recommend that these types of fonts are used sparingly, if not at all. Another thing that you could do to increase readability on your site is to remember to chunk or group your content together. So chunking means that you create bite-sized pieces of content that your readers can easily digest. So by shortening your lines and your paragraphs, creating headlines for each of the paragraphs so that your client can see what each individual section is about, 
it makes it a little easier to read because we find that in websites people don't actually fully read they scan so you want your site to be scannable so having headlines having chunks of content and pulling out important bits of information by using the occasional bold or bullet list is a good way to make the information stand out so that people can easily scan it and grab the information that you want you want to keep things short if possible but if you do have a lot of content that you need to display break it up break it up so it doesn't look like a long tiring dissertation but something that people could easily just read next we'll discuss the role of site speed site speed is one of those things that attorneys sometimes obsess over without fully understanding it and its role in their web presence is site speed important to your online presence the answer is yes a site that takes too long to load will frustrate your potential clients and they'll go elsewhere to find the answers to their questions and we know that Google is concerned about user experience and part of that experience is whether the page information loads quickly enough for someone who finds it search engines also need to crawl and digest information on websites quickly and slow sites can hurt this process but in the grand scheme of things, site speed is one of the hundreds of signals that Google uses to determine rank and relevancy. But the real issue here is that a slow site can frustrate an otherwise enthusiastic potential client who, in being frustrated, is likely to leave your site and go elsewhere, maybe even to a competitor's site and hire them instead of you. That's why it's valuable to remove any unnecessary heavy elements that can cause your site to load more slowly. Let me also say that there are attorneys who are concerned, almost obsessed, when their site doesn't measure 100 out of 100 for site speed. And let me explain why a perfect site speed score doesn't always translate to a good website. First of all, if I was to create a website that is simply a blank page, that site might actually score perfectly according to the site speed calculator. The problem here is that there is nothing on the site. And as soon as I start to add elements, the site speed will start to decrease. But if you add a lot of unnecessary heavy elements, that decrease will be more significant. So at the far end of the spectrum, you have a blank page that scores really well. And on the other hand, you have a, a site with all the fancy bells and whistles that's gonna score poorly. So the deal here is, balance, having all of the necessary elements that drive traffic and engagement, and removing the bells and whistles that can be distracting and can take away from your overall presence is what you want to achieve. Next we'll discuss social media from a design perspective. Your law firm's social media presence can affect how your brand performs, and if it's not consistent with the rest of your online presence, it might become confusing for your potential clients. The look of your brand is determined by your logo, your layout, colors, and all other design elements. The visual identity of your brand can be affected by how these elements work. When it's done right, your estate planning practice can create a visually stunning page that reflects your brand's personality and message effectively. Some general guidelines to keep in mind when it comes to visual branding is one, keep your colors, your logo, and layout similar across all platforms. Again, people expect consistency and something that they recognize. Your official website, your newsletter, your business cards, your flyers, your billboards should all have the same and similar design that you represent on all of your social media platforms. This is the value of starting off with really good branding, a good color scheme, and a versatile logo that can work both stacked and long. This makes all of these other things that you need to create a lot easier. And lastly, you want to use similar tone and language in all of your content. Rachel talked about this a little bit in the first part of the series, but conflicting messages or conflicting tone can confuse your potential clients and may harm your brand. So it's important to keep your content consistent, whether it's on your substantive pages from your site, your blog posts, or your social media updates.
Bombarding your audience with content, especially if it's the same again and again, can also be a problem. Keep the pace a bit varied. You have to realize that Twitter users and Facebook users may expect very different posting frequencies from a company. So try to keep with the pace of the network that you're using. Also, I mentioned in the first part of the series, people don't like being constantly advertised to. So taking the call my firm now approach can really turn people away from doing just that. Use your social media as a tool to promote content that gives your potential clients something to think about. Surprise them with facts that they didn't know. Give them valuable information that they can use. Think about creating infographics that are highly shareable. When you do that, you're much more likely to see your content shared by others, which again helps to drive traffic back to your site. And now that I've finished talking about social media from a design perspective, Victoria is going to tell you a little bit more about social media from a strategy standpoint. Thanks, Sophia. So if you joined us for the first part in this series, welcome back. If you didn't, let me briefly recap what we discussed there. We talked about what SEO is and how search engines work. We talked about understanding how your potential clients use the internet. Uh, we discussed common myths about SEO and online legal marketing, and we introduced some topics like blogging and substantive content. And as always, if you're interested in that webinar and you didn't get to see it, that webinar is now available to view on demand over at the Lawlytics website. So here's what we're going to be discussing today in terms of web strategy, social media. Some of you may be asking why the topic of social media wasn't introduced in the first part of this three-part series. And there was a specific reason for that. We see it that social media is really a supplementary aspect of your law firm's web presence. And so often we see attorneys really obsessing over it or um, spending time signing up for every social media platform there is or accidentally using it in ways that can undermine the work that they're doing elsewhere on the web. So we're talking about it now. And the reason for that is if you're joining us for this particular webinar, it should be at the point at which you've really got the foundation of your law firm's website in place in terms of developing and publishing content on a regular basis. So if social media is a supplement to your law firm's web presence, why do you need it? That's something that we're going to discuss in just a moment, as well as discussing which social media sites are the most beneficial for attorneys, because not all of them confer the same advantage, or in some cases, any real advantage at all. We're also going to talk about using social media effectively. And I think once you understand what social media is meant to do in terms of your web presence, this is going to make a lot of sense to you. So why do estate planning attorneys need social media? Social media presence can be valuable for law firms in general. There was an article written in Forbes not too long ago that suggests that employers who are doing research on perhaps their future employees may be suspicious of those who don't have a Facebook just because of the normalization of social media presence. As that applies to your law firm, because of the ubiquity of social media and how often we use it, people may feel suspicious or just frustrated with you if you don't have a social media presence. And in an age where so many things really revolve around the internet, no matter what device people are consuming content from, tech abandonment can raise some red flags for potential clients. They expect to find you in the places where they're looking, whether that's on your website or blog or being able to interact with you on Facebook or recommending you to somebody else on Twitter. And one of the best ways to promote the content on your law firm's website is through social media. So when you're done writing a blog post, for example, you can let your followers on social media know that it's there. And this is a good way to drive traffic back to your law firm's website. And of course, while some of your potential clients may find you through search engines, promoting your work on social media helps your work get some additional exposure in a way that's easily shareable with others too. So which social media do you need? 
And before I get into anything specific, I think it's important for attorneys to exercise some discretion when they're choosing their social media, because it's not a good time of, or good use rather, of your time and effort to indiscriminately fill out profiles on every social media site that there is. Just like there are tons of online directories that attorneys can choose from, that doesn't mean that you should fill out every profile that you can. For example, something like Yelp or Avo may be much more useful than some other directories. And you want to pick something that's useful for both you and your potential clients. The same sort of idea goes for social media as well. You don't want to choose just any social medium or choose all of them or choose ones that aren't particularly useful. You want to choose the ones where you'll expect to find your potential clients and where they expect to find you. Now, if you do take the other route of indiscriminately choosing social media, what happens is that you'll likely spread your messaging way too thin and ultimately dilute your message to your potential clients. So that's why it's a much better choice to select the right ones, the essential ones, than it is to just put yourself out there and sort of hope for the best. And if you've been joining us um, on our webinars for a while, this message shouldn't be too surprising to you. We are very much advocates of strategy and strategic thinking when it comes to any aspect of your law firm's web presence, because that's how you avoid wasting time and wasting money on strategies that you may only later discover don't work. So in sum, there are a ton of social media sites out there, and it's really about striking the balance between having absolutely no web presence, which, as I said, could be a turnoff for potential clients, and then on the other hand, being present everywhere from Facebook to Snapchat to Instagram, because that's a strategy that isn't a good use of your time and your energy, and it's also a strategy that is unlikely to produce the kind of results that you're looking for as an estate planning attorney. There are just some platforms that are more useful than others for lawyers. So let's talk about the big three that we think are a good place for attorneys to start. First, of course, is Facebook, and it shouldn't be a surprise that that makes the list. Facebook has about a billion users and is such an ingrained part of our existence now that much like Google, there are people who use Facebook as a verb. Social media, as I said, is an increasingly normal part of our lives, and so much so that we often want other aspects of our web activity combined with it. This has really become evident in that while some people, myself included, will still go to a news aggregate to find out what's happening in the world, a lot of people actually use their Facebook. And Facebook's approach to the news may reveal a little something about this. So we know that 66% of American adults use Facebook. Of that 66%, 41% get their news from that social media site. And that's regardless of uh, gender, race, age, or education level. So more people are getting their news from social media than ever before. And yet, when these people are polled, these people do not consider Facebook to be a quote-unquote important news source. So interestingly, it appears that Facebook users aren't actively seeking out the news. But of those who do read news on Facebook, about a fifth of them say that they think Facebook is a useful place to get the news, and 78% say that they stumble upon the news while using Facebook for non-news related reasons. And there was one participant in this particular Pew Research study who said, I believe Facebook is a good way to find out the news without actually looking for it. So this is really a good opportunity for you to capitalize on this by sharing information through this particular social media. Now, there may be a question of, do I need a Facebook business page? Do I need to use my personal page? And the answer to that can really be both. There are drawbacks and benefits to each. So, for example, if you decide to use a business page, you can reach people outside of your basic friend circle, but a drawback to that is to do that, you may have to spend some money on promoting posts, and that may or may not be a good use of your advertising budget. It really just depends. And this is something that Dan touched on um, in a webinar that we had a couple weeks ago about pay-per-click marketing, and that's now available to view on demand over at the Lawlytics website as well. So moving on to the next social media platform, that is Twitter. Here's what makes Twitter so great. So 
not only are you limited to those 140 characters, but the brevity of those posts are often what makes them so popular. People don't like to sift through tons of information to get to what they want to read. And not only that, but people generally love little nuggets of information. And with Twitter, just by virtue of the fact that your post length is limited, you have to get right to the point. Twitter is also a great way to reach potential clients and also referral sources. So, for example, if somebody posts a relevant question, somebody else may tag you and say, hey, get in touch with this attorney. Really, it can be that easy in a lot of cases. Another thing that I find particularly interesting about Twitter um, is this, and I wrote a blog post about this a little while back. Um, I don't know if I have any basketball fans who are listening, but if you've been keeping up with the news, you'll know that basketball star Stephen Curry is getting his own social media platform. But that's not the most interesting part. The most interesting part, at least as I see it, is how he got there. So Curry really had, at one point, an, an okay following on Twitter, but when he faced an injury that kept him off the court, he started interacting quite heavily um, with his Twitter followers. And the result was that he ended up amassing this extraordinary number of followers, about four and a half million. And now there are so many that he was really struggling to keep up with them, and thus his need for his own social media platform to sift through all those tweets. But the lesson here is in the value of using social media. Twitter, in particular, is good for this. To have real and often real-time discussions with your potential clients and referral sources. If you joined us for the, the first webinar in this series, I mentioned that expression that said that people won't care about what you know until they know how much you care. And this is a great place to exercise that philosophy. In a moment, we're going to talk a little bit more about having discussions on the web too. But let's move on to the last one here, and that's LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is maybe a little bit different from these first two in that it can be quite valuable for you, but in a different way from Facebook and Twitter. LinkedIn is particularly valuable for peer-to-peer -peer referrals and for networking. It's a great place to showcase your online resume, and sharing information there can bolster your thought leadership. You can publish blog posts specifically to LinkedIn as well, that being outside of publishing links to your pieces on your law firm website. And this can be a nice way to link back to many other pieces on your site. But I do caution you that if you're going to do that, make sure that you have a really solid content foundation on your own site first before you start contributing to something like LinkedIn. So not all law firms are the same, but based on how useful a social medium is to both attorneys and potential clients, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn are really three good places to start. And as I said, just as there are many online legal directories, not all of them are equally beneficial to attorneys. Each platform has its own culture and guidelines. Um, as I said, Twitter promotes brevity at 140 characters. LinkedIn is really best for peer-to-peer -peer contact and referrals. So consider how you want to use the platform in question and what benefit it may provide your law firm and your potential clients before you sign up. So the right social media platforms, when you use them wisely, can help to drive traffic to your law firm's website and blog. So if I haven't said it enough yet, be selective about the sites that you choose. You can use platforms like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn to promote recent blog posts that you've written. But a question we sometimes get is, do you have to write an entirely new blog post as a status update on your Facebook? And the answer to that is no, not at all. Um, in fact, when you use social media the right way, you'll expend or should expend a minimum amount of effort to promote your work. And in terms of expending as little energy as possible, if you have good technology to assist you in this effort, that's really helpful. So instead of copying and pasting the entire text of your blog into a new status update on Facebook, um, what you should do instead is link to the original blog post because you're trying to drive traffic back to your site. Don't forget to write a catchy intro and add a relevant picture to increase engagement. And as I said, if you're short on time, using a system like Lawlytics that allows you to update all of your relevant social media in just a couple clicks can really help you promote your work fast.
So in the first part of this series, I briefly discussed the idea that a lack of engagement with content, and that's whether you're not adding new evergreen content to your site or you're not blogging often, that can signal disinterest to potential clients who are looking at your web presence. So it's important to stay engaged on social media as well. As I said, promoting your blogs on social media can help drive traffic back to your site. But what it also can do is help others on social media share your message from within that platform, which should drive even more traffic to your site. So by writing pieces that provide useful information especially if that information is new or surprising or shocking, what you do is that you increase the likelihood that such a piece is going to be shared by others who find it relevant to their interests or know somebody else who might be interested in it as well. So where shareable pieces are concerned. You may want to try creating and sharing infographics on your law firm's social media. Infographics in particular provide lots of information without having to commit to a lengthy read, and they're often very ideal for sharing um, online with others. Again, if you're going to delve into something like infographics, make sure that you have that solid um, foundation of content in place first. So promoting your blogs is a good way to increase your visibility, but as I mentioned earlier, social media is also a good place to generate discussions and interest in your work outside of your blog's comment section. Social media is not a one-way street, and in order to increase interactions with your potential clients and your referral sources, it's important to think about your own interactions too. You can use your social media to ask questions, to create polls, to um, gather information that can help you write even better blogs that really answer your potential clients' questions. And tagging others in posts and tweets can both improve your networking and heighten your visibility. Now, you'll note here that I say generating discussions where appropriate. And it's a topic that I want to bring up because sometimes generating discussions can go a little bit awry for attorneys. So here are some things you may want to avoid. Now, opinions about certain things can be beneficial to your business. Um, as an example, you know, an immigration attorney might have the ability to take a very strong political stance in that they may not care about alienating one side. Or if you're very pro-business and you only represent insurance companies against liability, my point is that clients want to know that you believe in the same things that they do. But say for a general DUI attorney, it might be dangerous to take a strong political stance. So whatever you do before you post a new status update, before you tweet something, ask yourself, if I say this to somebody, will all of my potential clients be comfortable with it? Um, another thing to mention is that a lot of attorneys may choose to vent about their clients on social media, and that can be dangerous. So assume that whatever you say is really part of the permanent record and that there's an easy method of comparing it against everything else that you've ever said, both in terms of um, content and consistency. Screenshots last forever, and I'll talk about that more on the next slide. So controlling your marketing. If you're thinking about hiring somebody to broadcast for your law firm on social media who isn't a lawyer and doesn't understand legal ethics, that can be a really risky move. The average social media expert may not know uh, what words can or can't be used, and they may not understand legal ethics, and there are all kinds of dangers that can cause you as the attorney a lot of really big headaches. Um, if you're not controlling your social media in your firm or have somebody who understands all the needs of your firm and understands legal ethics, then what happens is that the potential upside of having somebody to handle your social media for you becomes outweighed by the real and potential downside of the problems that can be caused by having a non-lawyer handle your social media presence. So whether you're participating in social media, in online legal directories, or anywhere else on the web, your focus should stay on the marketing that you own and that you control. As I said, social media can be a helpful supplementary tool, but it's important for attorneys to 
focus their efforts on their own law firm's blog and website, as well as other marketing that you own, things like email newsletters. Social media can help you attract potential clients from places other than search engines, but to keep their attention, of course, you're going to want to provide them with the most relevant and useful information that answers the questions that they have. So not only is social media something that you can easily do yourself, and particularly if you're a Lawlytics member, you know how easy it is to integrate your social media accounts with us, but also for the fact that it's something that you should do yourself. Don't go delegating your tweets or your Facebook posts to a non-lawyer. Having a designated social media intern can be really tempting if you think it's going to reduce some sort of workload, but it's also something that can get you into a lot of trouble. Take Twitter, for example. You have a max of 140 characters to work with. What's the worst that could theoretically happen? As it turns out, the answer to that is a lot, actually. There was a famous case from, I believe, either last year or the year before about how Publishing one bad tweet can seriously ruin your life. There was a woman who I won't mention by name who was a PR executive on vacation, and she made a few off-color jokes in a tweet and then turned her phone off and hopped on a plane to her vacation destination. And at that time, she had maybe 200 followers on Twitter. So while this woman was in the air with her phone off, unable to recognize what she had done or even apologize for it, her tweet started getting a lot of attention, and not the good kind. As I heard one writer put it, Twitter disasters are the quickest source of outrage, and outrage is traffic. So this woman didn't have a huge following before, but now she did, and it was really for all of the wrong reasons. She even ended up with her own hashtag as people, I kid you not, tracked her flight across the Atlantic. And unfortunately, much in the way that many of these stories end, Several hours later, she became part of a complete social media disaster that had her fired from her job in the end. So if you look her name up today um, on Google, basically all you can find about her is in regard to this particular incident. So an entire career snuffed out in a couple tweets. Now, back to how this applies to you. This woman, of course, made her own major faux pas, and naturally, we would caution you against that. But again, hiring an intern or a manager or any non-lawyer who doesn't understand um, the rules and legal ethics can cost you big. So one last point I'd like to make here about social media. Um, as I said before, Lawlytics makes it really, really easy to associate any of the social media accounts that you want to add and announce things like blog posts in just a couple clicks. As you can see here, all you have to do is click that little blue checkbox there that says announce to social media, add whatever sort of status update you want to accompany the post, and then select any of the social media that you want to post that update to. So of course you can choose all of them, you can choose just some of them. We really give you a lot of options for how you want to control your social media presence. Then, of course, when you're done, all you have to do is click that green publish button. So now I'm going to go back to those metrics that matter that we were discussing in the beginning. And during my introduction, I had this slide up, and I noted that these metrics really provide a true north. They speak clearly, they cut through the noise and the distractions, and the signal that they provide can light the way for any law firm to grow. And why is that? The answer to that is this. If a marketing activity doesn't increase your firm's profits, then why do it? And we've heard too many lawyers say that they essentially work for, you know, whichever marketing vendor it is, whether it's, you know, it used to be the Yellow Pages, now it's some of the larger legal marketing companies. And unless the ego is in check, in terms of your law firm, bigger for the sake of bigger without a corresponding increase in profits isn't just vanity, it's also exhausting. For law firms who are already engaged in online marketing, we find that the easiest thing to do is to increase their profits by making what the firm already has work, work better. And by plugging the leaks and getting rid of the illusions and then reallocating the firm's investments of time and money into things that drive profits, it's oftentimes very easy to quickly increase the firm's marketing ROI and sometimes drastically. 
So increases in profits, that's just the first step before moving on to an increase in revenue. And this maximizes the firm's returns over time because you start out with optimizing rather than just going and going without really having a clear direction. And that paves the way to exponential growth when it's time to start driving additional revenue. Once marketing profitability is dialed in and you're sure the ROI is there, then it's easy and predictable to throw more fuel on the fire. But this is the part where most lawyers get on the wrong track. So in chasing growth, they start listening to the wrong voices and delegating to the wrong people and chasing the wrong metrics. And soon what it starts to look like, as Dan has previously described it, is a triathlete training for the Ironman on a cannoli diet. So we, we mentioned the cannoli diet reference for this reason, because you can get a nice burst of energy from a sugar rush eating a cannoli, but the success of your online marketing isn't a sprint, it's an endurance race. And a temporary increase in profits or revenue can actually be dangerous when it's not replicable. And a little luck early on can set a firm far off course. The worst thing that can happen to a firm is to have some success in their marketing and to not know why that is. So for that reason, number three in the list here is extremely important. You have to be able to increase your profits and your revenue, but an important part of what should be a scientific process to a degree is replicability and repeatability. That's vital. If you can't repeat what you did before, you're just placing blind bets at that point. So how do you know whether you're on the right track or whether you're on the wrong track? Let's start by looking at some of the most common metrics that are used to measure the growth of law firm marketing. So these metrics, um, they're common, but they really provide empty calories. And the list that you see here, of course, is not exhaustive. And the purpose of this webinar isn't to go into detail about all of the ways that SEO and marketing speak can set your law firm's marketing on the wrong course. But by looking at a few of these, our hope is that it causes you to think critically about all of the metrics that are presented to your law firm so that you can determine whether you're following a good map or a bad one. So let's just look at a few of these. There are hundreds of different quote unquote scores available that purport to grade the success or potential of a website. And many of these scores, which oftentimes come with reports, are readily available for any marketing salesperson to buy and to white label and to pass it off as a marketing tool to say, haha, look, here's what's wrong with your website. And it works with lawyers because lawyers are used to getting pretty good grades. So when attorneys, of course, find out that they're getting a, a C minus or a D plus or even an A minus, it makes them uneasy. But without all of the information about your firm, about your client base, about your referral base, about your marketing dynamics, about the external forces that drive public awareness and consumer behavior, such as um, the economy or things like that, without having access to the actual intelligence about the actual business that interacts with your law firm's website, these reports can simply amount to just random numbers, even if they're produced by an algorithm. And not only can they be completely inaccurate, they can really send you in the wrong direction and divert your attention from what matters when it comes to your marketing. When it comes to online legal marketing, the only algorithms that matter are Google's. And there is no amount of SEO doublespeak that can render a score on a report useful. So to put it into perspective, think about something like AVO ratings. And if you're not already nodding your head in agreement, visit avo.com and look up some lawyers in your area that you know are amongst the best. And then compare their scores to lawyers that you know maybe aren't so great. And you'll see that on Avo's 1 to 10 scale, you're going to see a couple things. You're going to see some really good lawyers who have really bad ratings. And you're also going to see some mediocre lawyers with perfect or near perfect ratings. And what I'm getting at here is that these marketing reports provide about the same amount of actionable intelligence as just simply going and trusting those AVO ratings. Um, you know, what that provides to an average consumer who doesn't delve any deeper beyond simply that one to 10 score. 
SEO salespeople have an interest in distracting you from your bottom line, and they do so using terms like the next ones you see here, hits, clicks, visits, um, and they use those terms frequently. But these metrics aren't necessarily related to increasing profits and revenue. And sometimes, and in some cases, they prove to be erosive of profits. Of course, it doesn't matter as an estate planning attorney how many tattoo enthusiasts or sports fans or teenagers hit click or visit your site. They aren't your audience. And this goes for metrics like Facebook likes and Twitter follows as well. To argue that these metrics matter would be like arguing for the admission of hearsay evidence. In context, they could be relevant, but it's incumbent upon you to hold yourself accountable for the discipline of properly qualifying them in the context of the ROI that they actually produce. One more, so rank down there at the bottom. Rank is really another red herring. And lots of marketers try to entice attorneys to focus on getting to the um, the quote unquote top of Google. And if you were present for the first part of this three part series, you may remember me talking about why the top of Google is really nonsense. And if you didn't go back and check that out, you may find that interesting. But many attorneys who spend and strive to get to this mythical place, the top of Google, um, when they, they arrive there and they thought that that's where they wanted to go, they find out that it doesn't support an increase in profits or reven revenue or repeatability. So we talk a lot about building appreciating assets here at Lawlytics. And when you focus on profits, and revenue and replicability and you break free of the SEO double speak and the tools of deception, your efforts will start to transform your law firm's website into an appreciating asset that not only generates perpetual business for your law firm now, and that's with minimal additional expense or effort or complaint, but it also transforms your firm's website into an asset that has intrinsic value. We have customers who have ignored the red herrings and they've avoided the, the cannoli diet that we discussed earlier and they've followed our content-based strategies who have built these multi-million dollar per year revenue generating engines. Their websites continue to feed them while they're practicing and not only that, but when they retire from law or when they switch gears, these sites can be sold for quite a profit in some cases, providing a retirement or a healthy annuity for you and your family. And Dan himself would tell you that this is the case as well because he did this for himself. So growth risks. The brutal truth is that Creating online success is simple, but it's also hard work. And most of the risk comes from the choices that you make. So let's discuss a couple of these here. The first is misguided efforts. That saying about garbage in, garbage out also applies to your website. The more that you do the wrong things, the more that those wrong things are going to amplify your problems. And if you're not measuring and you don't know that these things are causing problems, by the time that you do get around to measuring it, you're going to have such a mess that it becomes almost impossible to do so. Next up is deficient execution. So lawyers who become wildly successful don't dabble. They learn how it works and they form those healthy habits of repeating what works over and over again. And it may not be quick, but overall, when you look at ROI over time and the wealth that these attorneys are able to accumulate versus attorneys who just sort of chase one thing to the next, the lawyers who don't dabble come out way ahead. The lawyers who fail at online marketing fail because they do a little bit of something and then they give up or they get distracted by the latest SEO salespeople, um, whoever is sending them an email or cold calls their office. Intake systems. So sometimes lawyers snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. They'll do everything right in their marketing, but then they neglect the next portion of the revenue journey. And the most common thing that we see is that they fail to have adequate intake systems set up in their office. And this goes for anything from having the right person um, or people answering the telephone in your office to having follow-up protocols so that potential clients are inclined to hire you um, 
and those who are inclined to hire you do so and so on and so forth. Next up is bad targeting. So most marketers don't understand how different the business dynamics of different practice areas can be. So if you're an estate planning attorney with a social media campaign that targets Instagram and Pinterest, or if you're focusing more than just a passing effort on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, as far as getting your message out there, there's a good chance that you're barking up the wrong tree. People don't necessarily go to social media looking for that sort of thing. And as I've said, of course, there is a place for social media. But if you're focusing on a social media strategy to the exclusion of doing a solid content strategy on your law firm's website and blog um, where people actually go to find answers, you're probably spinning your wheels. Same goes for things like if you're trying to target very general keywords like estate planning lawyer. To do so, you're going to pay a lot for that phrase or spend a lot of effort or both. And it's hard to optimize for because it's so general. And the end result is that you're going to get a minimal return that you'll constantly have to fight to maintain. Lastly is a discussion about the unsupportable market. So. This seems really basic, but we have seen lawyers try to squeeze more business out of markets than those markets support. A little bit like trying to squeeze juice out of a, an orange that's, that's already done. So you don't want to accidentally focus on something too narrow to the exclusion of something that um, might be a better revenue generator. It just depends, but it's essential to know what your total addressable market is and then to optimize your marketing for that reality. I just want to spend a moment on some, some concluding thoughts here. So for an attorney who really wants to dive deep into the subject of SEO, we have plenty of resources over at the Lawlytics website. Um, we have lots of blog posts and webinars that go much deeper into the topic. But despite the high volume of information that's out there, success is not complicated. In fact, Contrary to what SEO snake oil salesmen are going to tell you, SEO is not hard and it's something that you can learn in a couple hours and you can really learn everything you need to know in that time. Doing SEO the right way boils down to content. Your content is the lifeblood of your website success and without it, nothing else ever can or ever will produce lasting results for your firm. And although we've said it many times before, it does bear repeating write for the audience that leads to increased profit and revenue. Write for your potential clients, write for your referral sources, and for the people who influence them. 99% of sound SEO strategy is simply saying no to what 99% of SEO salespeople are asking you to buy. Just a couple last points here. The internet is the first impression that nearly all potential clients get of you and get of your firm. So it's important not to ignore your reputation. Even when you have a potential client that's referred to you, they're going to interact with your web presence before they make contact with you. So it's really important that you tend to your reputation, which includes getting reviews online. It's important that you know how to display those reviews well, and ultimately, if you have them, dealing with negative reviews. And at some point, you may have to deal with a negative one if you haven't already. So we recommend that you start thinking about reviews before that happens. We do have a reputation management add-on to Lawlytics. And if you're listening and you are a Lawlytics member, we are very pleased to be able to provide you with BirdEye Reputation Management, which is one of the leading reputation management platforms. And we're able to offer that to you at a greatly reduced price and as an add-on to your membership rather than um, what you would pay retail if you went through them directly. We want to provide it to you at cost because it's that important to get those positive reviews and deal with anything negative if it does come along. It's good to plan ahead. We did a webinar on this topic a few weeks back and we recommend checking that out or checking out the link that you see here to learn more about reputation management. If you're not a Lawlytics member, we can also provide it to you. You just wouldn't get as big a discount as you would as a Lawlytics member. But if you are interested, let us know and we're happy to walk you through it. 
local marketing. So local marketing ties in quite closely to reputation management. So that's, of course, why we bring it up. It's important to claim, consolidate, and maintain your local listings. However, contrary to what a lot of salespeople are going to tell you, you should not be paying somebody to do this for you unless uh, you were to have many, many, many office locations. If you are a single office or even if you have a couple locations, it's going to take 10 to 20 minutes of your time to get your location in order and little to no maintenance afterward. If you're a Lawlytics member and you're confused about how to do this, get in touch with us and we'll walk you through it. Another aspect of this is local content targeting. So Rachel talked a little bit about that in both of these webinars, in both the, the first and second part. And we have other webinars that are specifically local focused too. And it's really easy to use the local marketing features in Lawlytics to target people at a local level. There are a lot of ways that you can bridge into various local locations, whether that's on the county or state level, or even more drilled down than that. And again, if you're a Lawlytics member and you want some help thinking about that, let us know and we're happy to help you out. The next topic that I want to bring up quickly is paid online attorney ads. We did a webinar a few weeks ago um, that, again, we do recommend that you check out that traces the money trail of PPC marketing and shows you how the money is made and oftentimes how it's lost for attorneys. The bottom line here is that PPC advertising, while it can provide a boost and a bridge for certain practice areas, it can also be a trap in many respects that leaves attorneys dependent on a bid marketplace. So it's not a good, sound, long-term business strategy because it's impossible to predict what your costs are going to be if you do it. So if you do decide to do PPC, it is incumbent upon your firm to have an exit strategy meaning that you have a way to survive marketing-wise if all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you've been bid out of the marketplace. Again, we recommend that you check out that webinar. Lastly, let's talk a little bit about your firm's online infrastructure. The thing that we see happening when attorneys start getting a lot of success with Lawlytics is this. The more clients that they bring in, the more that they need to prepare downstream to handle all of those clients. And that includes things like intake and case management and billing and so on. So as you enter this growth phase of your law firm's marketing, it's really important to think ahead. What kind of intake systems are you going to need? How is that going to look? And if you go to lawlytics.com forward slash integrations, we do have a list of some of the technologies that we work well with. Um, typically, the next step for lawyers as they get busy using Lawlytics for their marketing is to then utilize something like an intake system that will help them capture and follow up with leads um, or even get contracts and retainer agreements signed for new leads. And for the ones that we really like working with, um, one of them is Lexicata. We integrate natively with that program to push leads from Lawlytics into Lexicata. The next step after that is generally a case management system. And one of the more popular ones um, is Clio, and we provide native integration with that as well. So you can push leads from Lawlytics to Clio or from Lawlytics to Lexicata and then from Lexicata to Clio. And either way, you can add these things later, but it is important to think about how your practice is going to deal with additional business because we've had lawyers join Lawlytics and then double their business. And then they run into this situation where they have got too many leads that they can handle. And we've had attorneys come to us and say things like, you know, can you take our phone number off of our site and just leave the online submission form because we're getting too many phone calls. So again, important to think about that technology as you grow. So in summation, growing a law firm's web presence isn't rocket science, but it does take some time and it does take some effort. When you focus on the right things and you form these healthy habits around doing these things consistently, and when you avoid SEO snake oil and dependence on pay-per-click, and when you have your reputation management in place and your local listings are claimed, growth happens. So if you haven't yet seen the first webinar in this series about estate planning websites, there are a lot of foundational elements that can help you get started on the right track. If you're already well on your way to growing, I hope that today's webinar provided some useful information and the inspiration to stay focused on repeating and refining what works and removing or changing what isn't working. 
Next month, I hope you'll join us for the final webinar in this series in which we're going to talk about how to take a steadily growing law firm website and make it a truly dominant market force. I, of course, want to thank Sophia and Rachel for their presentations. Dan's going to be back with us next week. And thank you to all of you who attended this webinar. I hope it helped, and I hope to see you again soon. And with that, I'm going to end the recording and go to questions.